Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. Julian Assange was 38 years old when WikiLeaks published the video Collateral Murder that shows the U.S. Army killing a dozen civilians, two journalists employed by Rutgers, and a good Samaritan who stopped to help the wounded. Rutgers formally attempted to obtain the video, but the Pentagon refused to hand it over. The video of what happened remained on U.S. military servers until published by WikiLeaks. Collateral murder had a massive impact. The millions of dollars poured into Pentagon PR messaging could not make the public unsee the war crime. Julian Assange is now 52 years old and confined in a prison in London. The United States government is seeking to extradite him, still very pissed off how his journalism exposed the mendacity of our foreign policy. Let's discuss. Well, warm greetings. We're excited, uh, Greg and I, to have uh, Kevin on our show, Kevin Gostola, who is an American journalist, uh, um, author, author of a very pertinent book, uh, Guilty of Journalism, uh, which is a detailed look at the Julian Assange uh, situation. And I guess you, your beat is kind of the whistleblower, WikiLeaks, national security, press freedom, that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you curate the Dissenter uh, 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 magazine or dissenter.org. Uh, and got a very good Substack, which I subscribe to, and I've been following you and, and tracking you for the last couple of weeks. And you're very prolific and right on, right on the money. So, so welcome to our welcome to our podcast. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Good. You know, um, as I understand it, you are one of the very few journalists that has been covering this WikiLeaks situation from the very beginning. Um, and uh, occasionally you'll have, you know, the, the press sweep in when there's big events occurring, but you were the one, one of the very few that's been in the, been in the courtroom right from the start when uh, uh, WikiLeaks was getting uh, information and Julian Assange was publishing. And tell me a little bit about that. Tell me some of the background of how you ended up uh, getting on this beat. Yes. So I come to it being part of the disruptors, I suppose you could call us, who see as the internet is changing journalism, that there are ways to build followings, there are ways to generate an audience uh, by having a blog or by simply you know, taking advantage of different platforms that were available so that you can share your articles and uh, maybe even do more than that. Uh, eventually there's podcasting and eventually uh, people are doing live streams using video to cover protests and also various other news events. So around uh, the late 2000s, I was completing college in Chicago. I'm a, actually a film and video graduate. I was wanting to become a filmmaker, but recognizing that uh, it would take a while before I got to do my own projects and recognizing the kind of work that would go into that, I quickly turned my writing that I was doing on a regular basis from Chicago into something that could be, I guess it'd become a career. Mm -hmm. And I ended up in the newsroom of The Nation magazine in New York for six months, getting some newsroom experience of the longest running progressive magazine in the United States. They've been around for more than 150 years. And... Uh, I was I was motivated by opposition to the Iraq war. I was motivated by what I had learned about President George W. Bush's administration. And so when these documents were published by WikiLeaks, I naturally took an interest as they were shedding new light on the Afghanistan war, the Iraq war, in very 
small and minute details. Um, and uh, then there were over 250,000 diplomatic cables that slowly came out over a span of time. And the way that WikiLeaks made this information available was incredible for an up and coming journalist because here was the here were these sensitive documents that usually the New York Times, if we just use them as an example, would have privately as they were working on stories, but the public wouldn't have any idea where they were getting their information or how they were coming up with the scoops that they published. And I was able to go through myself and identify news stories that I thought would be remarkable to my readers and also what I just thought deserved attention. And then I would see them be shared widely. And and from that point, the natural progression was, if I'm benefiting from these documents that have been published, then I need to pay attention to the source. The source of those documents was Chelsea Manning. And she went through a court martial that lasted from the end of 2011 to 2013 was when she had the trial. I regularly made trips to Fort Meade, Maryland to cover this military court martial. And I was one of you know, four or five journalists that regularly made trips there. I didn't even live in the DC area. I lived in Chicago and I would go out there anytime there was a hearing. And then from that point on, I got to know the different various whistleblowers and, and uh, leakers uh, that were prosecuted under this Espionage Act. I familiarized myself with this law and I became more focused on this right up until the point where Julian Assange was arrested in April on April 11th, 2019. And then that became my primary focus, but there have been other smaller cases underneath that have continued to inform my understanding of what's going on with the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. You know, as I as I remember this and going back and getting some re research, doing some research about this, I remember the one event that sparked a lot of uh, interest was the uh, the case where the journalists, the Rut Rutgers journalists were were killed. The, the uh, Reuters journalists. Yeah, Re yeah. Re Reuters journalist. And they tried to get information from the government about what happened and they sandbag 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 and then when the actual film came out i it was just it was it was horrific uh it was um just the chatter of the people talking off camera and and uh the the, the good samaritan that helped that tried to help the people get them get them help with his two kids in the car that was was, was attacked and that was that created a lot of stir but i think from your your reporting it was the vault 7 that kind of really tipped the tipped the scale that really got the cia to the point of saying we are going to get you tell us about the vault 7 and what the how it, am i correct that that was probably yeah. more significant than the you know than the original Right. And to be clear here, Julian Assange, if you look at the indictment, there isn't a mention at all in it of these documents. Uh, that's a concern of his attorneys. It's something that's been raised across the pond before the UK courts that perhaps the government is just saving this for uh, when he gets here, maybe they'll add charges to the indictment or maybe um, he'll be convicted, and then during sentencing, they'll raise this information to try and give him a longer amount of time in prison. But these materials that you refer to are uh, the, the detailed cyber tools that the CIA uses for cyber hacking, or we could say offensive cyber warfare operations. And you know, these are things that we never had a debate or a discussion in our country about whether we thought this agency should be doing this sort of thing. For example, being able to plant a kind of device or a, a, a snooping mechanism in Samsung televisions so that when you turn them on, it effectively activates it. Now they can be used to spy on uh, you. And at any point, it would seem the CIA would be able to activate that and use it against targets. Uh, that, that Apple 
software would have security vulnerabilities that the CIA wouldn't tell the company about so that they could use those as a, as a means for their operations. So these are along the lines of the kinds of disclosures that we had from NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden about the National Security Agency that captivated so many people. And of course, I guess because we're recording this before, they're going to have the Academy Awards ceremony that that film Citizen Four actually ended up winning an Oscar um, for that documentary as it told the story of the journalists that worked with him in Hong Kong to get out those disclosures. Uh, but yes, these materials, because they came from the CIA, were the kinds of disclosures that so infuriated CIA Director Mike Pompeo and the various high-ranking officials at the CIA, that if you believe the reporting, and I do, because it came from some very good and well-seasoned journalists, um, Michael Isakoff, Sean Naylor, and Zach Dorfman, all national security journalists, worked on this Yahoo News report back in September 2021. They went to over 30 sources from the Trump administration, current and former, as well as current and former U.S. intelligence officials, and uncovered details about the extent to which Pompeo obsessed over Julian Assange. Allegedly, plans were sketched out to try and kidnap or poison or even kill Julian Assange. And there's, there's so many details there. Uh, but I just want to be clear that this idea of a CIA plot to assassinate Assange hasn't been made up by Julian Assange's attorneys, as was suggested in court a couple weeks ago in London, uh, this came from news reporting and his attorneys have now used it to argue that his life would be in danger because of the retaliation he could suffer in the U.S., knowing how much this organization, uh, the agency is opposed to Julia Assange. But you're right to focus on this as the thing that is the turning point, because up until these files are published, there isn't much movement at all in the government to charge him. And in fact, those files that I mentioned at first that made me want to become a journalist, those weren't files that ended up convincing uh, the Obama Justice Department to charge Julian Assange. I mean, in fact, they had a dilemma that they didn't think they could overcome because they believed that they had First Amendment issues. And if they charged Julian Assange, they would have to go forward and charge the people at the New York Times and The Guardian and The Washington Post that had published those documents. Therefore, they decided not to indict Julian Assange. And, and just, to, just to summarize, the, since 9-11, the CIA has kind of gone rogue, I guess is a nice way of saying it. And there's no suggestion that they went to a judge and says, we said, we have the ability to hack into an iPhone and turn it into a listening device on a citizen and will you give us permission to do that? They just did it. Or the use of the Samsung TV. Anybody with a Samsung TV, you think it's off. It's not off. They had a, a, a bug that they could turn it into a listening device. Uh, and that this was just part of their repertoire. This was part of what they did, including their own drone programs and their own paramilitary programs and, uh, you know, and it starts to get technical, but another thing was that we learned from those documents that it was possible for them to spoof or pretend to be a, a, a particular country that was engaged in a hack. So, for example, uh, that in my mind means that if they wanted to do an operation but leave fingerprints that made it look like China had just done the hacking, they could do that. They could make it look like Russia had just done the hacking as well. They developed this capability to conceal their operations and and leave breadcrumbs that would lead to the wrong target. And so, again, just knowing at the time when this was published, there was a lot of focus on cyber threats and, and everyone remains, you know, there's all kinds of geopolitics that have people focused on different threats. It does make you question, you know, how, how can you really know who are these people? I'm not trying to be... Right. Uh, an, an unnecessary conspiracy theorist here, but 
this is the sort of thing that we don't know what's going on. And they clearly were upset that people would be aware of their capabilities and know the kind of power that they had, which I think we can all agree doesn't have the type of oversight that it should. There certainly aren't hearings by Congress talking about uh, this this authority. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's regulated in a way that we get to go, oh, okay, yeah, I think we should give the CIA that power to do that so that we can protect our security. We, we've never had that conversation. We, we tried to with Feinstein and she got her computers bugged, right? Yeah. Yeah. Greg, what do you think? Do you uh, do you have a CIA file or just an FBI file, Greg? What, what, what about well, I mean, you, you, they're not going to expose my CIA file to me, but <laughs> I can get the FBI file. But no, I and, and that goes to the point I'd want to make, and that is it's not new. In fact, every every generation has a whistleblower or a, someone who expose the thankfully exposes the the uh, the criminality of our intelligence services, our our surveillance services. So it doesn't begin as you kind of alluded to with two thousand one. It goes back and back and back to the creation of the CIA and revelations in the seventies about COINTELPRO and all that. They do everything they possibly can do and everything they want to do until they're exposed. So American citizens should be grateful for the Daniel Ellsbergs, for the Julian Assanges. Those are the only people saving us from these people who have been given by our ruling elites these privileges. Yeah. Because they will always, they have always, and they always will go beyond that. There's no conspiracy theory. This is history. I mean, the original Sedition and Espionage Act uh, uh, goes back to what, 1798? And uh, I don't think that's ever been repealed. I mean, it's still, the, still kind of on the books. It's just everyone understands it's not right. And uh, the McCarthyism and all the things that went on, the FBI, people I know were set up by the FBI, were, were, were uh, uh, duped. You know, we're, we're and, and we have evidence of the CIA using drugs and so on. So I'm just grateful for Julian Assange. And I think this book, Guilty of Journalism, it's a beautiful title because those folks like Kevin and many others, uh, uh, Blumenthal and uh, Aaron Maté and others who are exposing these things, I know they get a million hits, but it's still a very small audience. They're saving us from our government. They're protecting us from our government. And, and until people in this country have that understanding, we're going to have a kind of corrupted politics we have today. So I throw out a, a kudos to, to Kevin. That's my comment. I really Kevin, it was, it. it was a good book. It was reading, it didn't read like, a, it just read like a murder mystery or something. You know, it was like going from one thing to the other. It's just, it was very engaging, very well written. So Thank you. Uh, and if I could just add to what Greg was saying very quickly he's absolutely right that it does go back and in fact in my comments i contextualize the cia's conduct by bringing in history you might see people who are in the establishment press act like they're baffled that the cia would plot against julian assange so i make sure that i remind people as i'm talking about it that this is the same agency that had well, like two or 300 different plots against Fidel Castro. This is the same agency that had a uh, a poison toothpaste plot for Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. And that, you know, I when I listen to, when I hear the thing of poisoning Julian Assange, that's the first moment in history that I recall, that I've read in detail the way in which the CIA had a plan to get poison toothpaste to Patrice Lumumba in the Congo after after he presented a threat to their control and domination in in the African continent. Uh, the, the other thing that I was struck by uh, with your book is how blatantly they um, broke the rules. For example, when the attorneys would come into the embassy to see Julian Assange, they would take their, you know, for security, they take their cell phones. Well, they took them in the other room and hacked them and scrubbed them and, and 
went through all of the data. I mean, just these are attorney client privileges and they did this as a matter of course. And that just that one fact alone should throw this case out. But and when Pompeo was uh, talking about all of these, you know, landing helicopters on the embassy and picking up Assange and you know putting them off to a dark site, and he didn't deny that he, he he didn't deny he didn't deny it. You know, it wasn't as if this was, you know, some rumor. It was almost something they were proud they were they were proud of. Um, to this day, Assange the- hasn't been hasn't been hasn't been accused of any crime. He's not been charged. And we, would be, in... we would be wrong to not uh, point out that the, the mainstream media, the, the quote unquote journalists, not the real journalists, the quote unquote journalists are complicit in all of this. On Tuesday, in preparation for this, I went through Wall Street Journal and I saw articles about Navalny, you know, journalists in other country, the persecution in China, et cetera, et cetera, which, of course, every mainstream journalist is, oh, it's appalling. It's terrible. There wasn't one word. The Wall Street Journal on Tuesday about Assange, Julian Assange. Not one word, not, not even a mention. And that's true of the mainstream media, whereas they're they're ginning people up around the abuse of journalists in other countries, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's it's what 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 is today's current? What's the current status of the case that's going on in England right now, uh, Kevin? I mean, can you bring us up to date on that, where things are right now? Certainly. So the legal status is that we are waiting for the appeals court in London. It's called the High Court of Justice to issue a decision on the permission to appeal. He asked for uh, permission to appeal. There was a hearing a couple of weeks ago as we're recording this on March 7th, and uh, which is also the anniversary of my book, Guilty of Journalism, the one year anniversary. And uh, so he's waiting, and if they deny it, then there will be uh, an opportunity to go to the European Court of Human Rights. But if they don't accept that petition, then he has no more ways of pursuing a legal challenge to extradition to the United States. That means he will be brought here on a plane. He will be put on trial in Alexandria, Virginia, which is just outside of Washington, D.C., and that is how close we are to this moment where the U.S. government would put a journalist or a publisher on trial and for the publication of documents, something that people who are reporters and editors do all the time at media organizations. And I need to stress this, too. There are now over 75 media organizations around the world that do the very thing that Julian Assange is in trouble for doing because he challenged the United States government, which is to set up a Dropbox on their websites that says, we will accept leaks, send us any information in the public interest if you have it. They are asking people who they know are working for governments, corporations, institutions that have private or secret information to send them anything that they can expose. And they tell them how to hide their uh, tracks, how to, how, to, how to do it so that they are not caught. They, they say download these pieces of software and uh, those tools are recommended. That's something that WikiLeaks has gotten in trouble for in this case, or Julian Assange is getting in trouble for in this case. Um, and then they will share this information. They publish this information. And, uh, you know, they might be a little bit more careful about it than WikiLeaks, which is to say that they might lose a little bit of their integrity as they ask the government what they can and can't get away with publishing. But they're doing the exact same act that Julian Assange is going to possibly be put on trial for in the United States. So how can they get, you mentioned that in your book, you use the, I'm looking it up here, secure drop. Yeah, is the kind of the standard. If you go to Secure Drop, share and accept documents securely, and you scroll down the page, Washington Post, Al Jazeera, The Guardian, The Intercept. Th- these are you know, he- you know, yeah. help us get, send us send us information. If if he gets convicted, then what's going to stop the government from shutting all these things down? Uh, I. I 
Am I being naive or? No, you're not. The people who are being naive work for these organizations that are using this tool. They're the people who aren't doing enough to talk about this day in and day out. They talk about Evan Gershkovich being jailed. That's the Wall Street Journal reporter who Vladimir Putin has put in detention. And I think they're right to stand up for him. I don't believe that he should be in detention. I think he has a right to come home just as much as Julian Assange has a right to return to Australia, where he's from, because he's an Australian citizen, and uh, should not be prosecuted for violating U.S. secrecy law. And, uh, you know, they, they need to recognize that politics can change at any moment. And that's something that I've heard whistleblowers talk about in D.C., but also it can apply to journalists now, because we're, we have such a politicized climate i i think to be fair it probably has always been this way but we're very sensitive now because we can track it and follow it so closely through the internet and we can see things happening you know down to the very minute we can see how things are developing with any given story or event and so which is which is to say that you know if you don't think you're in trouble right now it is possible that president donald trump can be uh could win another term in the White House and then bring back all these people who believe that the press were unfairly gunning after Donald Trump for all the four years that he was president. What do you think they're going to do as those organizations try to investigate Donald Trump? I don't think they're going to hesitate for a moment to use the power that has been unleashed by the Justice Department to charge reporters or editors or to try and shut down media organizations by going to the courts. I think that that'll absolutely happen. And I also don't think that Biden is completely off limits to this idea either. I think that we could see certain developments happen with him. It just hasn't gotten to that point yet. But the hostility that exists among Republicans in particular, you know, where they do see journalists as enemies. And this is not to say that Democrats are friends of journalists. I'm not making that suggestion. But the way in which they are willing to go to this point and, and, and weaponize these laws, I think we really need to be aware. And I don't, I'm, not, I'm not here to try to convince, the last thing I'll say is I'm not here to try and convince CNN or NBC News people, or anyone that they need to care about this case. If they don't want to protect themselves, I suppose they're putting their own profession at risk. And I've, I feel terrible for them that they're sacrificing the security that they have right now because there is a status quo that benefits them. It doesn't benefit me, but there is a status quo that benefits what I call the prestige media in the sense that the government has viewed them as off limits. But that goes away the moment that Julian Assange is put on trial and convicted, because at that point, the government can can do this trick where they they're kind of doing it already, but they can do this trick where they look at you and say, yeah, you're a journalist, but what you did, we don't think that's journalism. So we're going to charge you with a crime. And then they pursue the charges and your label what you do is a professional and what's supposed to be protected under the Constitution, that no longer matters to them. One of my absolute I, heroes uh... was Daniel Ellsberg. And, you know, when the Pentagon Papers came out, uh, it literally changed my politics. I mean, it took, took, took me off the fence and said, this is, this is wrong. He was this close to going to prison for the rest of his life. Had they not done the stupid break-in and embarrassed them with that break in, I, he, 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 he would die in jail that close. And it was probably the singular most gallant act in stopping the Vietnam War by one person. Um, I don't, I don't know. Greg, what do you think of Daniel Ellsberg? Is he your hero too? I'm sure he, I obviously he is, right? Yeah, I brought him up earlier. Absolutely. I, but I think, uh, Kevin, you're far too kind to the mainstream media. Uh, maybe it's me because I'm old and cynical, but I don't. I think most uh, the people that are employed in the mainstream media are quite smug and quite content, quite well paid. And I don't think you're going to shame them <laughs> into worrying about censorship. I just don't believe that for one one second. There's a 
a famous 50s skit, uh, Beyond the Fringe. Uh, uh, Dudley Moore, you may know that name, Dudley Moore, uh, uh, an actor. He was a principal of four players. They did a skit about Lord Beaverbrook and the British press and how they were all journalists and they were talking about journalism and they were going to expose the whole thing one day and my memoirs and my in my, uh, I'm going to write the novel and expose Beaverbrook and the entire British press for their lies and so on. And but I can't do it now. I've got to pay my bills and so on. It's funny as hell. You want to listen to it, but it's more it's more representative from the 50s of what I think the press is like. I don't think people that work for the New York Times are really, um, uh, let's say, militants for journalism. I don't think that they're fighters for journalism. I think they're perfectly content to bank their money. They go, sure, there are some, and they're the ones that do step forward once in a while, arrive, uh, go above the crowd and lose their jobs and become alternative media people. But for the most part, we're dealing with people who went to elite schools and are perfectly fine with the kind of media we have. That's what makes it work so well. That's what makes the entire thing work so well. And I think you always have to ask yourself, why does the institution play the way the role it does? I don't know. You know, Kevin, what do you, what do you think? The you have the incident of the Gaza with all of the mass rape stories that turned out to be exposed by the Gray Zone, uh, Matt uh, Matt and yeah. and then and the inter intercept the intercept essentially, and you know they stopped their podcast from publishing. They did get they did expose the mendacity of this reporter with no experience at all being put on a huge story. Um, they, they did have all that came from the alternative press. None of it came from the mainstream press. It was the embarrassment of the alternative press. Uh, is there any, is, is there hope in journalism for people like you and uh, Matte and some of these other independent journalists Um you know that are, uh, or or is are the big is the big press just too big and we're not going to be able to deal with it? I don't know. What do you think? There's hope in the sense that they don't have a monopoly over information. It's still possible for journalists that are not in on controlling the narrative to get those stories out there that that challenge it. And I think, you know, it's. I've not thought of this, but it's possible that the reason why the New York Times was so vulnerable to what The Intercept did and what The Gray Zone and there's been other outlets like Mondo Weiss and Electronic Intifada have done some really good work in their Israel, Palestine outlets that have covered that extensively. It's possible that this media analysis has was able to get so much attention because the Israeli government has stopped journalists from around the world from being able to access Gaza and made it so that the only people who are reporting are those who remain in Gaza, who were already there to begin with, who are basically mm -hmm. trapped in this open air prison and are Palestinians. And then of course are actually more vulnerable to attacks and being killed. We've seen well over a hundred Palestinian journalists killed. There's a Palestinian journalist syndicate that says 10% uh, of their membership now has been uh, massacred as a result of this war. And so I, I just wonder if Israeli government, which is a policy that is tacitly supported by the U.S., everything they do, the U.S. is saying, OK, behind closed doors in a diplomatic cable that we haven't read, read but at some point it would be great if we could read them. Uh, and they are barring journalists, and by doing that, they are creating a vacuum. Well, so certain media outlets are going to have sources, and they're going to put out their own stories, but those other journalists that might want to access Gaza that can't get into it, their only way of covering this story might be to pick apart those those reports that are coming from the New York Times or the Washington Post that are unbelievable or seem like uh, they're thinly sourced and shouldn't be treated as the truth. And so they're, they basically, by way of uh, the censorship from the Israeli government, all of these U.S. media outlets that have usually played ball with 
you know, the Israeli government or uh, the Israeli military forces to be even more specific, you know, I think they're in trouble now because we can see that they are spinning lies and it, and it is pretty obvious. And I would just add that the complicity of the press that does not go unnoticed in my book, there's a whole chapter that describes three examples where the media in particular has fueled Julian Assange's prosecution. And that comes from the extradition decision that was issued against Julian Assange, where their own reporting reinforced the idea in this district judge's mind that he was not a journalist. But beyond that, I also have examples in the book of times when they didn't behave like WikiLeaks. They didn't publish the truth. They were sitting on the truth and they knew that they had something that was newsworthy, but they didn't share it with the public because the U.S. government would have been upset. Like when they knew that there was a secret drone military base, a secret, like so it was a Saudi drone base, something like that, that they, that they hid. Another example was knowing the identity of this contractor, Raymond Davis, who was uh, caught up in an incident in Pakistan. And as it turned out, he was a CIA asset. And uh, his identity was known to the press, but they covered it up and did not share it with us as this scandal was erupting during the Obama administration. Of course, there are others that are more salient and are well known. Um, and, and, and those are like sitting on the warrantless wiretapping scandal sitting on that information until President George W. Bush was reelected in 04 and then going forward and publishing that story, something that James Risen fought the New York Times over and then uh, basically forced their hand by saying, well, if you're not going to run it in the New York Times, I'll put it in my book. And he did. You have a podcast or is it unauthorized disclosure or the, yeah. something, something like that? You are so good. I mean, I, I three three days ago I went to a, a Dark Side of the Moon uh, concert in a local federal way. They have I don't know if you know of the Black uh, Black Blackjack Symphony that does a um, anyway. It's 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 a band that does covers, and they did the Dark Side of the Moon. I am a big Roger Walters fan. I mean, I just I just love him. You did an excellent overview of a CNN reporter interviewing him and you had the full transcript the full tape where Roger Walters is articulate and knows the UN laws and you know is well read he's extremely high IQ very very thoughtful in how he approaches things and then you show the uncut version where it's just these little attack snippets of the of the journalist yeah, the and cut you version. Can't, yeah. You just can't watch the whole. You can't watch the whole thing, the cut and the uncut, with realizing that. Wait a second, I am totally being jerked around here. This is not accurate. You did another uh, similar thing with the oh, who was the guy? Um, uh, Jamel Jaffer, the national security guy, that was yeah. on PBS NewsHour. And he's doing this very confident overview of the Julian Assange case. And you stop the tape and you just say, he's not telling the truth. That's not right. He's, you know. So I think that there is a there's a place for new journalism that is certainly making people much more skeptical of the MSNBCs, the CNN. Obviously, Fox has lost case, but... Um, you know, those other more mainstream are not mainstream at all. They're, you know, they're, they're, they have a script and they're they're following it. I don't know. So I want to give you props for how well you how well you, you keep doing that type of thing. That's needed greatly. So. I don't know, Greg, what's what are your thoughts? Is, uh, is there any uh, hope, for, hope for the truth coming out with uh, young whippersnappers uh, like Kevin and his. Uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, journalism. I, think... I mean, are we. Are we going to be saved here or what? No, no. But what we do have going <laughs> for us are that there are a lot of people on the on the left side or somewhat left who are intensely involved in politics, like yourself, who subscribe to Patreon, all the different uh, uh, sites. And now 
these new young journalists have learned ways of making money independently. The key question is independence. Back in the 40s, I mean, uh, every newspaper in this country, and there are an enormous number of newspapers, major newspapers in major cities, had foreign correspondents. That's all gone. It's all disappeared. It's a major structural change, which is just as much to blame for the lack of any understanding of what's going on in the world as our CIA's engagement. But are these younger journalists now are, are able to make a living, make some money through subscriptions and so forth. That's an encouraging thing, but it's not something that is intentional on the part of the mainstream media. They don't want to see that. They want to monopolize it. I recall back in the, uh, when the Syrian war was going full blast, there was a Washington Post, I think, journalist, so-called journalist, I, I remember her name, I think, because it was kind of strange, called Liz Sly. And she did all the reporting from Beirut. And it takes me back to something Kevin said about access in, in Gaza. You don't have access because it's really the idea for let people in. Well, the Syrians would welcome Western reporters in Syria. They just didn't go. They stayed in Beirut. And basically, foreign affairs are done today with the mainstream media, with press handouts from the American embassy. That's the way information is garnered. What does that do? It means people like Assange and others that are willing to risk their lives are much more important to us today than even in the past. It's really critical that we have that kind of journalism because we're not going to get it. We're not going to flow in the mainstream media, at least in the 40s and 50s. With all these foreign correspondents, someone would step out and say, I'm getting out of line, so I'm going to write a book. And that would be beginning of another career outside of journalism. That doesn't exist today really at all, frankly. So we really owe a great, great debt to people who are taking these risks we have to separate them from the mainstream media reporters. They're they're really not worth our our attention or our uh, our concern. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen, Kevin? They're bought and sold. So thank thanks for the ones that are. Yeah. So Kevin, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, I I have a little bit of ray of hope, don't you? That these these judges have been asking some fairly good questions in the last round. Um. You know, Austra uh, Australia is uh, having the parliament making um, proclamations that they need to release it, release Julian. Yeah. So let me focus on what would be the best possible outcome and whether it's possible that we could get there. The best possible outcome is that the U.S. Justice Department would drop the charges against Julian Assange and just walk away from the case. And, and then Julian Assange would be able to get on a plane. He would be deported by the United Kingdom to Australia, but he would get to leave with his family, the family that he started while he was in the embassy, because he's now married to Stella and he has two new kids that he hasn't spent any time with other than meeting them in prison or uh, seeing them in the embassy when he was under total surveillance, he saw one of one of his kids uh, as a baby, but they were only there for like one or two visits before it was considered unsafe to bring them there anymore because there were there were basically goons that were lurking around and stalking people who came to the embassy. So a political solution could be possible. I don't have any faith in the legal system. I suppose I'm not answering your question because I don't actually think the courts are going to spare Julian Assange. I think that it's a charade, um, or as Roger Waters would say, a charade, and that uh, this is something that is going to require international pressure in order for us to get to the point where he is spared. And if you believe that that's possible, and I think we should keep working for it, I think that we have the potential to surprise ourselves. I didn't think that President Barack Obama was going to release uh, Manning from prison before completing her sentence. She had 35-year prison sentence at Fort Leavenworth and was freed after six and a half, seven years. Uh, so I did not expect that to happen before Barack Obama left office. That was owed to the pressure that was building up among supporters for Manning. And then now when you think about it, there are little things happening that show cracks in the Western alliance or the NATO alliance, so to speak. 
German in Germany just the other day, German leader Olaf Scholz said that he thought it would be a good thing if the British courts blocked extradition to the United States. And he said that would be good because if he comes to the U.S., uh, this is a persecution for publishing state secrets. So it should be uh, the, the courts should step in and protect Julian Assange. Australia is a big deal, in my opinion, because even though they behave mostly like a client state and tend to play the same role that the United Kingdom does, where they do the U.S., uh, they do the bidding of the U.S., Tony Blair was basically George W. Bush's poodle and made sure that the Iraq war was possible by he would go out there and say the things that the administration couldn't get away with saying. And I think that Australia can play that role, too. But in this moment, we see something different happening. We see that it's become a political issue in Julian Assange's home country and that in the last month, they passed a resolution that the prime minister, Anthony Albanese, supported that says very clearly to the U.S. government, the charges against Assange must be dropped, and we want this to end now so that Julian Assange can return home. That was passed in parliament. It was supported by the person who runs that country. And this is a country, This is Australia is part of the five eyes. These are five countries that have access to like all the U.S. intelligence collection in the world. That's Canada, New Zealand, the UK, um, and the US, and then Australia being the fifth country. And so it's a big deal to me that they would be willing to allow some kind of friction to enter this uh, relationship by publicly stating that the US is wrong to prosecute Julian Assange. I think that puts them in a, in a bad position. There's European countries that are waking up to this as well, and I know we can question how much power they really have to steer the U.S., but I don't think it really works when they're trying to come up with what they're going to do next with their NATO agenda if the players who are part of NATO are upset at the U.S. government for prosecuting a journalist. And I also don't think it helps counter... Russia or challenge China if the U.S. is prosecuting a journalist either. I think that that clearly undermines any sort of image they're trying to create, which, by the way, I don't believe, to be clear, I don't fall for this illusion, but this is the image that they want to go above and beyond to project, that they support democracy and human rights, and uh, and they can't do it anymore. Prosecuting Julian Assange makes it impossible to lie. Now, you could argue, I'll end here. You could argue, and I, I don't think this is cynical. I think it's actually realistic. You could argue that something is happening with the assault on Gaza and Julian Assange that says this rules-based order doesn't care about human rights anymore, doesn't, doesn't care about democracy, no longer thinks that those idealistic values are important to maintaining uh, geopolitical dominance in the world, that, that, that there's other ways to maintain it, uh, and they don't have to pay lip service to these ideas as they did 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's certainly possible that there's something shifting. And as they counter China or Russia, and they don't believe that those countries uphold human rights anyways, you could argue that they think there isn't any reason to try and uphold human rights on the part of the United States. But that being said, I do think that European countries and Australia present a, a, a possibility of ending this case against Julian Assange. And we know that they don't care about the Latin American countries. There are a number of them that have stood up for Assange. It's worth just making sure that I include in my response here that, uh, that Obrador, the Mexico president, has been a very big advocate and supporter of Julian Assange, even going into a private meeting with Joe Biden and making an issue out of it in his private meeting. Mm -hmm. Lula, the president of Brazil, has also been a big supporter of Julian Assange. But we know how the U.S. thinks of these global South countries. These are countries for the CIA to go in and start a coup and replace leaders who are not favorable to them. 
So they're not going to listen to any of those people. But they might listen to European leaders or the Australian leader if they say something about freeing Julian Assange. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well said. We're I, hopefully our next one of our next podcast is on the Pink Tide with uh, what's his name, uh, Greg Wilms, who is Elder. looking, yeah, looking Elder. at all of the 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 politics of the, you know, the shifting politics of Central America and. I don't know. Maybe we can have a different paradigm other than just you're with us or against us or, you know, you're you, you support America or you're a bunch of communists. I mean, that's we've been <laughs> using that model forever and it just doesn't seem to be working very well. So well, we have yeah, 20 but, years of uh, you your support the terrorists if you uh, don't. Yeah. Uh, for a while, we weren't communists. We were terrorist sympathizers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it's, we're uh, getting but we're getting back to the commie stuff. I mean, you know, the, 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 you've got uh, Trump talking about getting rid of all the Marxist professors and everything. So that, they, they, <laughs> you know, they're they're still jumping on that horse and beating it a little bit. So you know, whatever. So you got you got a, a big communist party in China, so that still exists, and they want to beat up on China. But I really appreciate the very credible argument you make that there may be some hope and. It does give us hope. I mean, it does give us some hope that uh, some folks will show a little more integrity and come to their senses and and stop this criminal act. Yeah. I, I Kevin, I'm going to link to your book, of course. A good book, really good book, and your Substack. It's worth people to just donate a you know a, a Starbucks a latte a month to support your journalism. That adds up, I guess, a little bit and. Uh, I'm uh, going to be really interested in seeing how you're going to approach this this final final trial that should be um, coming out in a week or so, I guess, with the final results. So, good luck. Stay with it. Stay it with probably it. will be um, a, a couple months. I mean, look, the final word that I'll leave you with here is is limbo. Limbo has been the way I define what Julian Assange is stuck in. Unfortunately. There have been times when it's been one or two years where he has no idea what's going to happen next. And it's up and it's if it's difficult for me as the journalist who covers it to plan my life, think of what it's like for the person who is in a maximum security prison for a nonviolent offense with terrorists, rapists, people accused of all sorts of violent crimes being treated like a thug when he didn't do anything to anybody and um, has been kept in conditions that um, are, are not far from total isolation. Yeah, and that mental health issue is a is a prominent uh, a prominent matter with them, and that's I think that's part of the game plan too. That's the the cruelty of all of this. So, thanks, thank you, and we'll Thank keep you. in touch. All right, hey, talk to you all later. Thank you.